Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I assume there's somebody there. I have no idea, but um, good to see you. Um, it's a lovely sunny day. I'm sure that we would much rather be out um, doing some field work, but instead uh, you've got me talking about uh, work at Medbury in West Sussex. So I'm just going to put on the slides now, and I haven't done this before, so it seems to be working okay. I hope you can see it. Um, okay, well, I'm going to be talking about uh, the work we've been doing at Medmury uh, by, with a group from the Chichester and District Archaeology Society. Um, but um, we haven't only been working at Medmury. Um, here are some images of uh, sites in Chichester Harbour. Um, there are lithic and ceramic assemblages at various places around the harbour, and uh, some of these are being investigated by Jeremy Board and uh, and the Potier. Uh, so that's one element of work. Um, we're also interested in routes around the harbour in terms of uh, wadeways, that's uh, routeways on foot essentially, and also uh, structures associated with the navigation in the harbour. Here, for example, you can see an artificial gravel um, well, projection really, which we're interpreting as a, a gravel haven structure basically for beaching and protecting small boat boats. Um, Mark Seaman is leading the work on uh, routes in the harbour, as we're calling this project. And then, in addition to that, of course, uh, we have new reports of sites that we didn't know about before. Um, here at East Head, at the, the mouth of Chichester Harbour, uh, we have very recently uh, had a, this structure reported. It's um, a circular structure of timber, as you see. It's at the apex of a V-shaped fish trap, essentially. And it seems to be a distinctively southern type of fish trap with a circular pond at the apex. Um, one of these in, um, in uh, Southampton Water has been dated to the Middle Saxon period. But really, we need to get out to plan and to sample this structure uh, for some radiocarbon dating. So we're not only working at memory, but memory is perhaps our main focus. So where is it? Why is it called memory, in fact? Now, this is a fairly imaginative map uh, produced by Wallace in 1999. Um, it purports to show the coastline, well, between the Iron Age and Saxon periods. You can probably make out the on coastline is indicated along here. And it goes from Portsmouth here, down to Selsey, and over to Little Hampton over here. And this is the Isle of Wight. So, but ignore the details of this. The main thing about it is that there were, at one time, a great many more embayments and a great many more islands than there are now. And this very indented coastline was protected by this, or a structure somewhere out here like this, which is a gravel bank, basically, which reduces the energy of a tidal, tidal impact. So the, these different embayments, some of which persist today, um, uh, were able to persist. This offshore barrier, we think, was probably destroyed from the 14th century onwards during a period of climatic change and increasing storminess. So this is Selsey here, Sel Seals Eye, Selsey, the Seals Island. Uh, this is Thorny Island here, Thorny Island, uh, meaning obviously an island covered with thorns. And this here is Medbury, the Middle Island. That's what Medbury means. Uh, so it's, it's really in this area here that we've been focusing our attention. That just gives you a bit of wider context, so I hope that's clear. Um, looking at the area from the air, and these are actually both holiday snaps. Uh, this is taken by our chairman on the way back to uh, Gatwick, I suppose. Um, this, we're looking southeast. This is Selsey here. Um, this is Bracklesham here. And here is this open area, which is Memory. And this I took from the, the boat going over to Lavra. Um, you can see basically we have a number of zones. We've got the sea, obviously, we've got the marshes and the coastal plain, and we've got the South Downs behind that. So it's essentially the um, 
coastal marshes and the immediate coastal plain that we're looking at. Okay, well, let's look at the area in a bit more detail. Um, these are images taken from two successive ordnance survey maps, one produced in 2009 and one in 2015. Um, now, as you see, in 2009, the, the coastline was very straight. It was very artificial, in fact, uh, because the gravel and shingle bank which protected this area was artificially maintained. It was bulldozed into place. And this was felt to be not a very sustainable long-term solution to, um, uh, to managing the area. Um, and so a realignment plan was instigated. Um, <clears throat> this involves, first of all, the construction of a new seawall, which you can see going around here, which much more effectively protects the settlements around the area. Um, in order to get um, spoil to create this, uh, this seawall, of course, a number of borrow pits had to be dug out, and we'll come back to that later. But once the seawall was in place, uh, the final stage was to breach the, 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 the gravel bank. Uh, so this could resume the kind of paleogeography that it would naturally have without the gravel bank being there. But things are not fixed. The, the, the coastline is constantly changing. And this map of 2015 is now quite out of, out of date uh, because the position of the breach has moved very significantly. And it will continue to do so until it reaches some kind of stability. Alongside that, the, the gravel and shingle bank is moving backwards, so moving inland. And that's an important point, which we'll, we'll come back to. It's historically been uh, quite an important feature of the uh, landscape. <clears throat> well, I mentioned that a number of borrow, borrow pits had to be dug to obtain uh, material for the bank, but it was, there was also some excavation in order to reduce the level of the flooded area in order to uh, enable certain kinds of habitat to develop. And uh, a programme of excavations was undertaken by Archaeology Southeast, which I'll call ASE from now on, um, from to, uh, mainly around 2013, and the work they did was published in 2019, um, A View from the Edge, uh, Spoiler Publications, Monograph 20. I haven't time really to go through everything that they found, but they found a very interesting and long-term sequence of archaeology and geology. This here is a very large erratic. It was transported along the channel by icebergs during the um, uh, during a glacial phase, and uh, we quite commonly find erratics of this sort. Um, in subsequent periods, they found uh, settlement and some burials at, at a number of periods uh, in, in the Bronze Age, Iron Age, Roman period, uh, a little bit of Saxon activity, and a great many fish traps of mainly medieval date. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they recorded uh, more recent uh, agricultural features and military features because uh, Menry has uh, in the past been uh, an important military site. One type of site which cropped up quite a bit, in fact, perhaps the commonest type of prehistoric site, is the burnt mound or burnt spread. Um, these are scatters of heat shattered flint, uh, Bronze Age in date. Um, we don't know their ultimate function, but at least one um, role they played was to produce hot water. Essentially, pits were dug or, or uh, tanks were made with timber, whichever, and uh, heated flints were, were thrown into that uh, container in order to produce hot water. Um, what use was made of the hot water, we don't really know, but uh, bathing it certainly seems to be a possibility. So. Um, We'll come back to Burnt Mounds in a bit, but we've certainly found quite a few more in our work on the shoreline. Okay, so this is an eroding coast. Um, it's uh, subject to direct wave action, as you see here at Selzy. Um, the long term result of that as it is, as I've said, to make the gravel bank move inland, but it also lowers the beach level. And this shows a groin in memory at uh, memory in March 2016. Now, in January of that year, the beach level had been up here. 
by March, it had been scoured down to there. So we've got a position, a situation really, where the uh, the beach is constantly coming and going. And when it's going is the period that we need to be there, really. Um, typically after major storms uh, removes a great deal of uh, beach material and gives us the, the opportunity to um, uh, well, find new sites, essentially. So what I'll do, I've been asking them for about a half an hour, so, so for the next 10, 15 minutes, I'll just talk through the sequence of archaeology or, and paleoecology, for that matter, at the site. Um, now, the earliest post-glacial material that we see are the, uh, the remains of uh, a sub submerged forest um, at a fairly low tide. Uh, fairly well down the tidal sequence. And this shows a couple of trees here and some vertical. There are also root systems within this. Um, well, of course, the, these sorts of submerged forests are quite common around the country, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with them. And they're also different dates, but this particular one is Neolithic. Uh, we know that from uh, a radiocarbon date, which uh, was collected from a root system. Uh, this looks a little bit odd. Essentially, it's overlain by intertidal clays, but, but they've been eroded as by, into runnels which cut through. Um, you'll see some more of this later on, but that's just the way that the, the clays erode here. But what that erosion has done is to re reveal this root system. Uh, we removed uh, just the few outer rings from that root in order to date uh, when it ceased to grow and by inference when that area became waterlogged and salinated. And we have a date of 2455 to 2290 calibrated BC for the tree. Um, we're assuming that the other trees are of similar date. Uh, most likely they are, but we haven't sufficient radiocarbon dates to confirm that. Looking at the stratigraphy, we have a tertiary deposit, clay, um, basically a stiff clay with flints in it, on that is a paleocene. On top of that, there are organic deposits with burnt flint, each shattered flint, part of the burnt flint mound. Uh, so this particular mound was located on a dry land surface. And that's a wider view, perhaps not a very good one, but it does show uh, where the burnt flint occurs. You can probably see it scattered around on the land surface. Um, other, so other examples of our flint, flint sites um, are spills of flint, really, which have gone into intertidal sediment. And you can see here three successive spills of burnt flint going into, into these muds. Uh, the dates from archaeology southeast on charcoal from these burnt mounds fall in this range, 1740 to 1490 Cal BC. Um, we, we haven't actually dated charcoal for ours, but uh, we have, do have a radiocarbon date, which I'll talk about in a moment. We haven't had a single artefact from the beach sites, and the only bone we found was of the great northern diver, um, which um, was identified by Polly Baker. It presumably just got there by accident. Um, it's quite interesting because the fact that a bird bone survives shows that if there had been animal bone, that too, mammal bone, yeah, that too would have survived, but it hasn't. So we can be fairly confident that these sites weren't related in any way to cooking. As I say, we, have, we don't have dates for the, the burnt mounds itself, but we do have a date on this. This is a linear hurdle fence, um, which, uh, I don't know what that noise was. Um, which was associated, associated with, with, with one of the burnt mounds, and it comes out with a date of 1555 to 1450 Cal BC, which falls within the range of um, uh, the uh, dates that archaeology southeast uh, obtained. So that's the Bronze Age, and that's mainly what we've got, burnt mounds. Moving on to the Iron Age, well, we only have one site, really, and this is a site which wasn't excavated by us, it was actually excavated by the police. Uh, it was reported to them by a dog walker and uh, lifted by the police. Um, they had to do what they 
well, you know what the police have to do. They they got it out rough fast uh, on a rising tide, and they didn't pay any attention to the context. But we do have this one mobile phone image of the bones in situ. And you can probably make out there is the lower jaw come loose. There's the cranium. Here's the spinal column. And by the time this photo was taken, the limbs had eroded away. I also just ask you to note these things here, these black objects, which I'll come back to, but that look very like uh, timber planks to me. So that's the only picture of the site we have in context. Uh, we have a date because the police obviously took a date. You know, they weren't sure whether it was uh, recent or not. Um, so it's Iron Age. It's a, a probably middle-aged man, arthritis of the spine. Uh, he has cribra obtalia, that's perforations at the, the back of the orbit uh, related to uh, nutritional deficiencies. He has a lot of tooth wear, calculus and periodontal disease. So this doesn't really look like uh, a high status individual. We don't really know the stratigraphic context, but looking at that photo, the gray color of the surrounding sediment strongly indicates that it's a, an intertidal creek. And as I've mentioned, the dark stripes around the head seem to be the degraded, degrade, degraded remains of wooden planks, uh, which suggests that the skeleton could have come from a planked structure, perhaps a platform or a boat. So this wasn't really a conventional burial. Um, it is more probably a placed body in a creek and on some sort of wooden structure. And this would fit quite well with uh, Iron Age practice. So um, uh, that's what we think it is. But that's the only evidence we have on the shoreline of Iron Age activity, that there is settlement further inland. Where are the Romans? Well, as you know, uh, Romans had a lot of stuff. Where, wherever Romans have been, if they've been there, you find a lot of pots, a lot of um, artifactual material in general. And we don't find that at all, even though we're not very far from Fishform Roman Palace um, and from Chichester, and also that there was settlement further inland um, uh, of a lower status. But, but um, we do have this one single find made by Peter King. Um, this is the uh, lower part of, well, it's half of the lower stone of a rotary quern, and it is almost certainly Roman. How it got there, heaven knows, it's unstratified. It's probably from a wreck or from an eroded rubbish deposit. After that, we have something of a gap in our sequence. Uh, we have um, not until really about the 16th century AD do we start picking up archaeology again. We have these braced timber fish traps. You can see these are vertical posts, these are horizontal braces which held them in place, and there's a line of wattle panels along there. Um, that just shows one of our members, Hugh Fisk, uh, recording the fish traps for 3D imagery, and there is a rotatable 3D image on our website if you want to have a, a better look at this. Um, anyway, these structures are uh, fundamentally 16th century in date, and we do also have some documentary evidence relating to stationary fishing at this period, uh, because it was disapproved of by the off offshore fishermen, who uh, thought that the stationary fishers onshore were depleting their stocks, which they may well have been to some extent. Here's a fish basket, also a similar sort of date, somewhere between about 1450, 1630, 16th, uh, 16th century really. Um, this is in situ and this is after being cleaned up. It seems to be either a fish basket or the base of an eel trap. And we have more recent uh, stationary fishery as well. Um, this is the uh, base of what's called a French pattern shrimp or prawn trap, uh, which is weighted down with interwoven flints, you can probably see one there. And that's what the whole thing would have looked like when in use. So plenty of evidence for stationary fishery, and in fact, even more. Uh, this is very frustrating. This is a one arm of a newly seen uh, V-shaped fish trap. It's about 25 meters long. Uh, we first saw this lace in February, 2020, just before the coronavirus lockdown. 
we were waiting for a low tide uh, to go out and plan it and obtain some of the radiocarbon dating. But of course, we haven't been able to get out there. Um, I'm going to hazard a guess that it's medieval, but uh, we do need a plan. And we do need some dates, so we will be going out there. Other finds include timbers from uh, wrecks, from the timber vessels. There are a couple, probably 18th, 19th century uh, wrecks, maybe from one known that won the, the Hasted Prize, which is just offshore, or maybe from some completely unknown wreck. And this is uh, an 18th century slow match pouch. It's uh, made of leather. It's uh, made of, uh, it basically makes a pouch in which a smoldering fuse could be kept, uh, which was used on naval vessels, vessels for igniting grenades. Uh, so you could ignite your grenade without having an open flame. Um, that's now being given to the uh, Royal Navy Museum for conservation and display. And again, it might have come from the wreck of the hazardous prize, or it might be from some other ship entirely. Okay, well, we, we also have, have evidence for destroyed farms along the coast. This is one. This is Thorny Farm. Um, you can see part of the wall still standing there. It's a very characteristic piece, Sussex uh, 19th century wall. Uh, we were able to get out, out there and make a plan of what survived. There were no uh, artefacts, oddly enough, from this site whatsoever. Uh, you would expect some pot, but we didn't find any. Um, so it looks like this was a farmyard area, not a domestic site. Um, it, if it was a farm there in the 19th century, also, it might have been a suitable site for one earlier. So we'll be looking out for this. Here are two wells, which were associated with Thorny Farm. Uh, one of them made of chalk blocks, neatly cut, and one of them made of timber and brick. Um, we tried to excavate these, but they're both filled with flowing sand, so we weren't able to get anything dateable from them. <clears throat> this shows the demise of Thorny Farm, really. Here it is in uh, 1842. Here's the sea. Here's Thorny Farm. Here it is in 1875. Here's the sea, rather closer. Here it is in 1896, um, still more, still closer, and this is 1933. No farm, it's gone. It's on. The, it's actually under the shingle bank there, and it's, in, it's only now that it's being exposed on the beach. Uh, we know from all our history that um, it had gone by 1914. In fact, um, there were still there was still farming there. Uh, the construction of uh, the growing of hay, um, but there was no farm, and uh, the the product was transported across the dunes back to Selsey to Miss Scrimger's barn. And this shows 1937 a wagon load, load of hay uh, being uh, carried over the dunes uh, back down to Selsey for use in the stables. One other find we made uh, this year is part of the old Coast Guard station at Medbury. Um, this is shown on a map of 1875, uh, but it was demolished after that and buried uh, under the shingle bank. Only in January this year was it re-exposed by uh, recession of the shingle ridge, which has gone back, you can perhaps see the right-hand image, to here. So this was formerly under that bank. Um, we expect to see more of this building as it, as it erodes further back. Um, just a few dimensions. Basically, there are, there are bedrooms, there are fireplaces, there's probably a garden and a path associated with it, a certain amount of Victorian pottery, and the base of uh, a wine or port bottle. And again, Hugh Fisk has made a 3D model, which you can look at on our website. Other activity in this area included marshland drainage ditches of 19th century date, which are now on the shore, but formerly were uh, land was the sea bank, and into them have fallen um, concrete anti-tank blocks, and also blocks of the Braderite rubble, which is being used for the new sea defences. Uh, so, but some of these, I think this one, maybe this one, are actually uh, cast concrete blocks. And then a very defended shore, like most of the south coast. Um, as in many areas, uh, there was an initial, an initial first phase defence the beach scaffolding, which you can see here. Now, in most places, it's been removed. 
um, but not here. It's a little bit too remote uh, for anybody to have bothered. So there's there's a lot of surviving 1940s scaffolding on the shore, and also an awful lot of uh, ordnance. Uh, the uh, from time to time, uh, the Royal Engineers have to um, the Royal Engineers may have to come to uh, detonate uh, ordnance that's found there. These are mainly, mainly cannon bullets from an air-to-ground gunnery range. So that brings me to the end. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the CDES team for their stalwart work, uh, the RSPB for giving access, James Kenny, Archaeology Southeast, and the Citizen team for professional support, and Luke Barber of Sussex Archaeological Collections, who's going, who has edited um, a publication which we hope will appear in 2020 in his volume. So I finished. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. That's fantastic. It's such a very, very exciting site. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, the first is um, somebody wondering if the Iron Age human remains were discovered broadly in the same area as the large quantities of Iron Age coins and coin hoards recovered over the last 100 years. No, no, it's um, they're, they're actually at Selsey itself. The the um... Yes, the the, the hoard, the, well, the the hoards essentially uh, are at Selsey. I mean, we think there's probably a trading settlement there, but that's uh, largely built over. Uh, we're much further uh, west than that, um, so it seems to be an isolated burial in a creek. Thank you. Um, another question is um, asking how much of the archaeology has been exposed because of the managed alignment scheme. Well, it's. A combination of things really. The channel going through the breach has shifted its position laterally, so it, is, it exposes things as it as it as it shifts position. But also, we in addition to that, we've got the long long term landers movement movement of the shingle bank, which is depleting the uh, uh, the level of the of the beach. So it's a combination of natural processes and human intervention. To a large extent, but it's mainly the cessation of human intervention that's causing the main changes we're seeing now. Oh, very interesting, and also associated with the alignment scheme, um, someone is wondering if um, our how how the local population reacted to the managed alignment scheme. How did that go down? Do you know? Well, um, there were some people found the idea of surrendering land a little bit difficult because there's no tradition of doing that in this country um, but of course the overall sea defenses put in place by the environment agency have massively increased people's safety uh, so uh, i think on, on balance uh, the, the things were pretty favorable there some people had objections um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't actually live there, so I'm not having exactly got my finger on the pulse. But I know there was there was some uh, some uh, objections to the scheme and some enthusiasm. Excellent, thank you. So I'm going to flick back this time. Hopefully, we'll sh actually show my screen. Uh, which apologies for uh, the very beginning. I'm afraid my slides weren't showing. Um, just to say that if you would like to find out more about the work of Citizen, then please have a look at our website where you'll find lots more information about uh, what we do. And here you'll also see the link to the website for the Chichester and District Archaeological Society. Finally, um, well, thank you very much for joining. Please do take a minute to complete the feedback form. We hope that you can join us again in the future and in the meantime stay safe thank you very much bye bye